Good morning. We welcome you to worship here at First UOC Poplar Bluff and pray God's blessing upon us as we worship the Lord together this Sunday. Uh, my name's John Gregory. Please, so pleased to serve as pastor here and to help lead in worship along with the choir and Cooper and Michael at the keyboard at the piano and the organ and our media team up in the balcony. Uh, friends, as we uh, begin this service, please take a moment and uh, register, register your attendance on the green inserts in the bulletin, unless you've already done that. And if you'd like any more information on something, please uh, fill that out and then put that in the offering plate later in the service. And uh, I feel like I'm going to break my normal pledge to you, but I am going to lift up a couple more announcements than I normally do because we had a couple special things coming up this uh, week ahead. Uh, first of all, this Wednesday, we're back to Wednesday night meals to wonderful Wednesday dinners. As I think so many of you know, I've not been here yet since we've had Wednesday night dinner, so I'm psyched, friends. Peter was wet wetting my appetite this morning while he was here doing some things before he headed off to other places to serve today. So please join us. That starts at 5 uh, this Wednesday night and be back going all during the school year up ahead. In fact, our uh, first kids and first UMY uh, youth be having back to school bash from 5 to 7 so your children and youth are welcome to join us of course as well. And also please note a week from today, next Sunday, we'll kick off our capital funds campaign, Building on Faith, Giving in Joy. We'll be showing a really great uh, video uh, with testimonials uh, from some of our members on video. We'll also have live uh, testimony here at this service from one of our members. We'll have some light refreshments as the plan after our worship service next Sunday. Please come and join us and watch the video. Our capital funds campaign got to preview it. Uh, Diane Becker and Tim Eddington uh, we put that together in this past week. It's really excellent. Uh, I know that it will bless you. So again, please, please join us next Sunday in worship. And, and finally, I'll invite you to read the other announcements. But please, uh, if you haven't already done this, please consider taking part in an intercessory prayer ministry. Uh, if you are led to consider that, you see Kay Campbell's contact information in the bulletin. You can follow up with her. And I appreciate her leadership in that. And I think that ministry is growing. If I'm not mistaken, somebody ran new to it, prayed for our 830 service this morning. I think for the, thank you for confirming that, Kay, for the first time. So I celebrate Tim doing that and uh, appreciate, Kay, appreciate personally your leadership of that and that prayer ministry, a vital thing uh, for our church and our community. And friends, with that, I think it's time for me to step back and to invite uh, uh, Cooper and the choir to step forward. I'm Roseanne Stannard. I'll be your uh, liturgist this morning. And before I have you stand, um, I will mention one thing that uh, John Gregory did not, which is if you are in the church council next week, we will have a meeting after the refreshment time after the service, um, as we would it's, instead of our normal time. Um, will you stand now and join me in the call to worship? The vision of God has come to us. The reign of God is close at hand. Yet so often we lose sight of God's vision. When we do, our hope falters. Let us seek the vision of God anew. Let us work as we pray that God's kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. This is the hope of all the earth. Amen. And please remain standing for our first hymn, number 89, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
you'll turn in your hymnals to page 884 to the affirmation of faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the presence of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. <laughs> you take the prayer concerns on your hearts and minds and bow with me and join with me in spirit in our morning prayer time. Would you pray with me? Lord, we give thanks for your love and grace. We give thanks for your vision shared with us in so many ways and that we'll hear later in this service today. As we think of persons who are hurting, as we think of persons in need, Lord, help us remind us of your love as we take this time to pray and especially to pray for others. Lord, I do lift up Donna Faye's daughter to you. And Lord, if it be possible, we pray for some miraculous turnaround in her health, even as she is terminally ill. But Lord, if that is not possible, we pray for your peace and your presence with Faye, the rest of Donna's siblings, and the rest of Faye's family. And Lord, we pray for ultimate healing with Donna in your time. Ultimate healing through resurrection life and the life to come in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray for others on our prayer list this day and persons on the, our list of, who are serving in the military. And we pray, we join in praying for them with our prayers for persons on our own hearts and minds. We lift them all up to you. And we pray for individuals healing, whether that be in the body, in the realm of the mind, of mental health and emotional well-being are in the spiritual realm too, O God, for a new or a renewed relationship, a right relationship with you. As I pause and invite people to name others before you in this time of prayer, I would say, O God, as we pray for individuals near and dear to us, we also pray for your world. We pray for every nation on the face of the earth, including our own. Lord, I pause and especially pray for the island of Maui and the state of Hawaii, the community of Lahaina, 
surrounding areas devastated by the wildfire in these past two weeks. Lord, we pray for the people there that lost loved ones, for those who were injured. Lord, we pray for the recovery process physically, emotionally, spiritually. We pray for church families that were devastated, church buildings destroyed, including Lahaina UMC. So again, Lord, we pray for your church there, your church capital C of the different denominations across the island of Maui and those especially affected by the devastating fires. And Lord, we pray for other places in our nation and the world, not in the news, but no less in need. So Lord, we pray for your church, for sisters and brothers in Christ, from those from, from here in our family at First UMC to those uh, across Poplar Bluff, our state, our country, and your world. Strengthen us together in shared service and prayer and witness and advocacy that your kingdom would come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, O oh God, in the midst of these many prayers, many needs, we give you thanks for so many blessings and joys, for the gift of life itself and the gifts of your creation, for our family and for our friends, for our community and nation, for, for special, special gifts of music and uh, of good food, of gifts, and for people sharing their gifts and talents with you and ministry here, Lord, in service in this church and in your church across our city and your world. And above all, O oh God, for your greatest gift, our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. And we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite our ushers to come forward at this time and invite uh, the people of the church and our guests to prepare to join in the giving and receiving of our tithes and offerings.
these gifts and the givers of these gifts that they all might be used for your ministry and for the work of your kingdom for it to come on earth as it is in heaven we ask and pray this in Jesus name Amen you may be seated our scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah the second chapter, verses 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah of Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. As chief among the mountains, it will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Let us go up into the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you pray with me before I preach this morning? Lord, speak through me. When need be, Lord, speak in spite of me. Speak in spite of the sin and contradictions in my life. But above all, O oh God, speak beyond me. Speak beyond my words and the words and wisdom of others to your word. Your living word for us in Jesus Christ, your word of life, your word of hope. 
And Lord, speak to us today your word of vision. Help us to see your vision anew for God's people, which is all people, and for your world, O God, and for the earth. Help us hear that in your word this day. And as the scripture tells us, to walk in the light of the Lord. Guide us in that, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. For today, I continue the sermon series I've been preaching the past few weeks, trying to answer the question, what is the overarching storyline of the Bible? Two weeks ago, we looked at what I suggested was the first movement, creation, rebellion, and reconciliation as told about in the book of Genesis. And then last week we examined the second movement that I suggested, liberation and formation from the book of Exodus. Of course, in reality, and probably you know this as well as I do, much of the rest of the Torah, and in fact, much of the rest of the Old Testament, is that story of God's formation of the people of God through instruction and law and testing. We see that in Joshua and Judges as God lifts up leaders for the people. And then later we see that in the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles as we see God's ongoing work of forming the people of God through the kings of Israel and Judah, even through their challenges and their shortcoming and their sin. And in the end, these books paint a picture of God's people, both their inner sin and oppression, their ongoing struggle to live with God's ways internally, and some of the ways, tragically, that the strong in Israeli society oppress the weaker and poor members of their own nation. In the midst of sin and oppression, in the midst of the people of God, and sometimes beyond the people of God, we see the third and final major movement of God's story in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. God lifts up a vision. Or to use some other words, God lifts up a sacred dream of exactly what life is intended to look like for the people of God and for all creation. God speaks through the prophets in what I would suggest the third major movement of the story of God in the Old Testament. In the prophets, there's a bit of a shift in the imagery of the vision of God for God's people. As you know, in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, there's talk about a promised land. And I know the vast majority of you all know that story. You know that the people eventually get to the promised land. Part of the tragic story is even while they lived in the promised land, they seem to be afflicted in many ways with the same things that challenged them in Egypt. On the one hand, internally, they were dealt with the internal impression of human sin, their own sin, and its brutal consequences for human life. And externally, even though they were no longer slaves, some of the more powerful oppressed the weaker and poor members of their society. Yet in spite of these challenges, the vision or dream of God continued among God's people inspired by the living God. But then during the exile, the dream of the peaceable kingdom becomes even stronger, even more all-encompassing. It now finds expression less in the language of land or space and more in the language of a day or a time. It morphs from a promised land into a promised time. A phrase I'm sure you're familiar with, one example, the day of the Lord. In other words, the Lord's time when oppressors would be overthrown and when corruption and infidelity would be replaced by virtue and integrity and when the blessing, justice, and shalom of God, a word I assume you've heard many times before, the Hebrew word we often translate as peace, but means more than just peace, a holistic peace both internally and externally. When the shalom of God would flow like a river, through the earth and fill the earth as the waters fill the oceans. Where do we see this dream and the prophets, this vision? We see it in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, in Joel, Hosea, and Amos, among other prophets. So I invite you this morning to look with this, reflect on it with me in just a little more detail. 
I'm going to reread Isaiah 2 for you, but read it in the version I normally work out about. A, this would be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I invite you to hear these words again. Such a bold vision. We might need to hear it twice in any given worship service. The word of, that Isaiah, son of Amaz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, he shall judge between many nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their plowshares. Excuse me, friends, I screwed up that line. Forgive me, Lord. That was bad, friends. Let me try that again. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Friends, that's possibly, probably, at least we could say arguably, the classic vision of the peaceable kingdom of God in the Old Testament. Thank, thank you, my brother. But as you may know, that's not the only place where God's vision is shared with the prophets. Let me read another passage. You bet, bet most of you know this as well as I do. Some of you probably read it better. We hear this often in Christmas time, but I invite you to hear it in August today. This is Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall place its hand over the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Friends, here we have not only the vision of shalom of God, but the source of shalom, the way of the Lord. We're told that the end of this vision is the earth will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord in the same way that the waters fill the oceans. And we see more of this vision elsewhere in Isaiah 65. We see it also in Micah, in Joel, in Amos, and in Hosea. And so in this kind of brief, very brief kind of summary of some of God's vision of the prophets. Let me close with a brief reading from Hosea. This is from chapter 2 verses 18 and 19. This again is God speaking through the prophet. I will make for you a covenant on that day with the wild animals, with the birds of the air and the creeping things of the ground and I will abolish the bow, the sword and war from the land and I will make you lie down in safety and I will take you for my wife forever. I will take you for my wife in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. Again, we see the vision of God's shalom that is peace and harmony and the justice of God for all creation. Here's God's vision for all the earth, the peaceable kingdom of God. First, let me pause and ask, what are we to do with these bold almost said visionary vision, but that's redundant, isn't it? But you kind of get the point there. What are we to do with these? I can tell you what many Christians have done in the past. If you read the Bible with the old six-line narrative, you push them off into the future somewhere beyond history. You either apply them just to heaven or at best maybe to some millennial time period shortly before that or maybe a combination of both. But friends, let me, speaking of bold scripture readings, let me share maybe another bold thought. Uh, another way to read these, again, I'm indebted to this, to Brian McLaren. What if we were to receive these images as a vision of the kind of future towards God is inviting us in history? What if we saw them 
less as an eternal destination beyond history and more as a guiding star within it. Less as a literal description and depiction and more as a prophetic promise and hope. Less a doctrine to be debated and more as an unquenchable dream that inspires us to unceasing constructive active action in the present. What if we saw them as a good future unfolding within time, within history, not a perfect state beyond time, beyond history? A fair question would be, why would you read them this way instead of the other way? I invite you to reflect on that some with me, and I'll share just a bit of, with you why I read them in an extremely similar way to Pastor Brian McLaren. First of all, when I read Isaiah 2 for myself, not when I'm preaching to you, but sitting at home with my Bible, I look at the opening, the time frame it talks about, and it says in the NRSV, in the days to come. It says in the NIV word, version that's in our pew by we heard earlier, in the latter days. It doesn't say anything about heaven. It doesn't say anything about beyond the time. But it says in the days to come. And then beyond that, it doesn't talk about the heavenly realm. The word of the Lord is going to come from there. Rather, it talks about Zion. You guys have heard of Zion before, right? It's a specific part of the city of Jerusalem. I don't know how quick we could get tickets, but if we could get an airplane ticket quick enough, we could be in Jerusalem tomorrow. Not the heavenly city, but the earthly city. That's in the state of Israel today. That's where this passage talks about instruction coming forth out of Zion, that corner where I think, if I'm not mistaken, some of you know this better than me, the temple stood, and out of Jerusalem itself. I read them this way because when I read the actual text in a common sense way, that's how the passage speaks to me. But let me say a little bit more to you, friends. Uh, I also read them this way because that's how I read the message of Jesus and, and better yet, I should probably say that's how I understand Jesus teaches me to pray and teaches you to pray and teaches us all to pray. Friends, I'm going to pause. I gotta, I'm going to go for just a second on a tangent. Some of you here, I wonder how, for how many years you've prayed the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. I bet some of you here are old enough. I bet some of you, I'm looking out at some of you. I bet some of you have been praying for 80 years every Sunday the same prayer. Others of you for 70 years or 65. And we prayed it earlier, so I know you know this. I'm just going to remind you the way Jesus taught us to pray when his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. One phrase in a prayer, you guys know, this prayer ain't too long. It's not like my sermon today, friends. <laughs> in a relatively brief prayer, he has us pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He doesn't have us pray, shoot us up, O oh God, up to heaven, where things will all be right. But he says, Lord, where things are right in your kingdom in heaven, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, here in history. That's the way Jesus teaches us to pray. And you know better than I do, we pray that every Sunday. And that guides me to read those scriptures in the same way. Just let me pause and shift gears here. One of the wonderful things about being living in today's time, one of the wonderful things about being Protestant, you don't, you don't have to accept the preacher's reading of scripture, although I hope you do some Sundays or so there. So I invite you to get the good book out yourself and read it yourself. I uh, so appreciate Cynthia's help so much. I put eight of these uh, scripture references with some of God's visions from the prophet uh, here at the bottom of your bulletin of the second page. I invite you, some of you might just want to start reading one now. I wish you'd kind of still keep listening to me, but I can't promise the scripture might be more informative than what I've got to say. But I invite you to read those this week and let's try to see God's vision and work with that. Friends, I got to keep moving, wrap this uh, message up here this morning. Friends, I'm going to try to recap in just some simple few words the threefold movement of, of, of the story of God in the Old Testament that I've suggested to you. I, I, invite, I envision that the Genesis story sets the stage of giving us a sacred vision of the past. 
a vision of God's creating and reconciling love in the midst of human sin and human weakness. And then it's as if the Exodus story situates us in the sacred present. A pilgrimage towards external and internal liberation from both the internal oppression of sin and ex any external forces that oppress us as we see God working to free people from slavery to sin and death and to free people from every kind of external bondage and oppression. And then the story of the peacemaking kingdom of God ignites our faith with a sacred dream for the future, a vision of hope, a vision of love. It represents a new creation and a new exodus. A new promised land that's not just one patch of ground somewhere in one corner of the world held by one people, but rather a vision of a promised time that encompasses the whole world. A vision better understood as a time than a place. A time when all people will live in peace and harmony. A time when people will live together justly and shall not hurt or destroy in all of God's sacred creation and the knowledge of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's the vision of our creative, liberating, hope-inspiring God. A vision for our lives, a vision for the church, a vision for the world, a vision for all creation, not just for human beings, but as was talked about for the animals and for the plant creation, I apologize, I didn't do any work in bio biology. I can't say it more correctly, friends, I'm sorry. A vision of God restoring what's broken, both in human lives and in creation. Friends, that's a bold, I think it's fair to say, even incredible vision for the future. And it's a vision that God shares with us for a particular reason. You see it in the last verse of the scripture. Let me get at it a little bit different way. God didn't just share this vision so preachers on any given Sunday could just stand up and talk about it like it was some history lesson that may date back. We might, different of you here, might different times. I think we'd at least agree. Isaiah, this part, Lord knows, may be written. Again, this is off top of my head, I'm, I'm, and I've been a long time since I was at seminary. Maybe written 2,700 years ago, 2,800, give or take a few. Not old history, but God shares the vision with the attention that by its light, we walk in it and follow it. Did you notice that last verse? This won't be my last words. I promise I'll wrap up quick, but I want to metaphorically end the sermon with these words. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us walk in light of this vision. It's not just meant for us to look at it and then go home and say to hell with that. I'll just keep living in my own way. Rather, God shared this vision that we would see it and seek after it and said to us, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord's vision given to us. May we do that. Friends, in a sense, this concludes the three-part sermon series I've been preaching about uh, one biblical storyline for the Old Testament. Of course, you might have noticed I left something kind of important out. I haven't talked about the New Testament at all. So please come back next Sunday. I'm not going to try to cover, don't panic. Don't stay away because you think I'm going to try to talk about all 27 books in one morning. I'm not going to do that. Don't panic. But I'm going to talk about Jesus next Sunday. And I'm going to talk about how we see Jesus in a different way if we look at him out of the story that he emerged out of. A story that we've been talking about these past three weeks, right? The story of Adam and Abraham. The story of Moses. The story of David and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Come, come join with me. Join with the choir. They're going to be here. I'm going to be here. Most of you are going to be here. Come back and join us next Sunday as we look about reading forward to Jesus through the Hebrew Bible, through the Old Testament. Friends, would you pray with me? Lord, help us to see your vision anew. Lord, while I have great respect for the Roman Catholic Church, Lord, I give you thanks to be Protestant today. 
We're free, free to read and interpret Scripture on our own. I invite your people to read it today, to read Isaiah 2 again in their homes, to read Isaiah, to read Micah, to read Hosea, to read Amos. Lord, help us see your vision anew. And Lord, I'll speak to myself now, Lord, and I pray others of here. Lord, don't help me read it and then just go my own way. Lord, help me. Help us that are part of your house, a part of the people of God. Let us walk in the light of your vision, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join us once again for our hymn of invitation. We're going to be singing number 555, Forward Through the Ages, number 555. give what would be actually a very short benediction. Would you give us a couple of very brief thoughts on the last line of this hymn? At the early service, they told me this hymn might not be very familiar to you. If I apologize if that's true, I hope it will become more familiar. I'm just going to share those last words as a kind of a part of our benediction today. So I think about scripture, I think about a people bound by God's far purpose. 
in one living whole. That's what the body of Christ is, a living organization that is alive, not only here in Poplar Bluff, not only in America, but across the world. Move we on together, not just as individuals, but together in the body of Jesus to the shining goal, to the vision that God gives us of God's peaceable kingdom. Forward through the ages in unbroken line, in an unbroken line of Christians, Wesley back in the 1700s and Luther back in the 1500s and Christians back in the Middle Ages and in the early church with Augustine all the way back to Jesus. Forward through the ages in unbroken line, move the faithful spirits at the call divine. May we wait those words come true this week, this month, this year in our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.